Yeah. Is it too low? There you go. Got it. That's it. Yeah, I think it's good. Thank you. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say. going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Now, I will be preaching out of many passages of Scripture over these next seven weeks, but I want you to keep in mind that this is going to be our base Scripture, because there's some truths in these first two verses, especially verse number 2, that I believe over the next seven weeks is going to help us in our walk with God. How many of you in this building would say, it is my desire to draw closer to God than I am right now? Yeah. Amen? And I can tell you tonight, friend, it is God's desire that you draw closer to Him as well. Amen? So I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse number 2. Wherefore, 
seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Aren't you thankful that we've got people that have gone on before us and they're overlooking the balconies of heaven and they're cheering us on, run the race, run the race, do not stop, keep running. If you have to walk, walk, if you have to crawl, crawl, it's worth it all. Let us lay aside every weight, those things that weigh us down, let us lay them aside. Now, I'm going to be honest with you that sometimes that's easier said than done. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can lay those things that weigh us down to keep us from getting closer to God. We can lay those things aside. And then notice what it says. Not only the weight, but also and the sin which does so easily beset us, that tells me in this race of faith that we are in, as we are journeying toward heaven, as we're journeying toward our walk with God, that sin has the ability to set us back. Amen? It has the ability to set us back. If you will, sometimes it could take us from this level maybe to this level. Now, stay with me. I'm going to explain that to you here in just a moment. But sin has a way of bringing death. The wages of sin is death. And it doesn't just come out and wham like that. It's subtle things. Notice what it says. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Those, those little things that begin to set us back. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a place that we was not at before. Everybody follow me? All right. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse number one tells us we're in a race. It tells us we're in a journey. There's no doubt, but there's no disputing the scripture there. Verse two, look on, looking unto Jesus. Say that with me. Looking unto Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to look to Jesus. Stop looking around and look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. <laughs> I love that because if Jesus brought me in, Jesus is going to see me through. Amen. He's the author and he's the finisher. So I don't have to worry about what Jesus is going to do for me. I've just got to do what I'm supposed to do to stay in the race. Oh, this is getting good to me already. <laughs> Notice what he did. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow. Over the next seven weeks, I'm going to preach a series entitled Taking It to the Next Level. Taking it to the next level. And I'm going to talk to you about seven levels of surrender. Seven levels of surrender. Father, help us tonight, I pray, to be able to teach and preach the word of the Lord with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, I believe that you have helped me, Lord, in my studies and gathering together material and praying and seeking the Holy Spirit's direction on this. God, this is just not another night. This is a night that you've set aside to speak to your body of believers, Lord. So I pray that you would speak to those that are here. You would speak to those that are online, God, and that you would, we would have your audience, God. We would have your ear, Lord, and that you would speak to us through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in Jesus' name and all of God's people said amen. I want you to look on the screens, if you will, for me, please. Taking it to the next level, seven levels of surrender. Now, this set of steps, it's, there's nothing holy, and honestly, there's really nothing scriptural about these set of steps. It is simply a visual to help you understand what I believe that God wants us to see. Now, what you need to see in this particular first picture is, is that we all begin at the same level, every one of us. If you'll take in front of those first set of steps, you'll see ground, that is ground level. That means that every person that has ever drawn breath on this earth has started right there in their walk of faith with God. 
That means that we were in the world. That place, that place right there that shows the brown, which is concrete there, that signifies, it symbolizes you and I that once were in the world. But then there was something that took place and we took a first step of faith toward Jesus and the beautiful word called salvation come to our life. Amen? So seven levels of surrender. I want you to keep these steps in your mind. I also want you to understand that you can go up levels. You can also come down levels. You say, Brother Bill, is that scriptural? I just showed it to you in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that easily besets us or brings us back down towards the world. Everybody follow me tonight. Now, The next thing that I want to show you is definitions of surrender. Definitions of surrender. It means to cease resistance. This is usually involved in a military term, if you will, as if somebody, as an army is coming against another army, and now they cease resistance to get that army, and they just kind of they kind of give it up. All right. But then there's another surrender to abandon oneself entirely. That means that you fought something over and over and over and over and over and you're tired of fighting and now you just abandon the whole thing and you just give yourself entirely to the way it goes and it's just going to be what it is. It just is what it is. And if it goes good, it goes good. If it goes bad, well, then it goes bad. That's not faith. Somebody say amen. Notice this. Here's the third definition of surrender. and This is the one that we need to cling to right here. To lay one's life down for a cause. To lay one's life down for a cause. This is the best scriptural description of surrender that I can find. To lay one's life down for a cause. Jesus defined it this way in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. He says, therefore, doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man take it from me. Watch this. But I lay it down of myself. Jesus said, I surrender my life for the cause of the heavenly father. He did that on his own accord. Nobody made him do it. Nobody, he did that on himself. He says, I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Now, what I want to parallel there with you is this. Jesus had the power to lay his life down. He had the power to take it up. You and I have a free will, and we have the power to use our free will towards the things of God, or we have the power to use our free will toward the things of this world in our flesh. Amen? Bump your neighbor and say, stay with him. We're going seven levels. It's going to be good. Now notice with me seven levels of surrender. Here are the seven levels that we're going to cover over the next seven weeks. First of all, salvation. Second of all, passion. Third of all, spirit-filled. Fourth, service. Fifth, absolute surrender. Sixth, spirit-led. And seven, intimacy with God. Who wants to be at number seven? Amen. Now you say, Brother Bill, I see spirit filled is third and spirit led is six. Should they not be, should they not coincide with one another? Well, let me just say this. A person can be spirit filled, can be spirit filled, but not willing to be spirit led. Amen. Amen. I know a lot of spirit-filled people that when it comes to situations, and I've been guilty of it myself, that I was not spirit-led. I was led by my flesh, even though I am filled with the Spirit of God. Amen? So there's something that happens in between those that allows us to start walking at a level to where now we are led of the Spirit and not of the flesh. I wish we could get there like that, but this is a process. It's called sanctification. Here's where we want to deal with tonight. We can't go anywhere. We can't go to any level whatsoever. 
We can't go to the second level, the third level, the fourth level, the fifth, the sixth, or the seventh. We can't go to any of those until we get the first level, and that level is salvation. Salvation. Salvation is the first and the most important. Without salvation, there are no other levels to go. The foundation of salvation is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Amen? That is the foundation of our, he is the foundation of our salvation. Now watch this. In this teaching, our goal is to equip people to walk closer to Christ without falling back. If everybody that had accepted Christ as their Savior and received salvation and not fallen back was in this house tonight, there's no way we would hold all the people. You couldn't hold them all. That parking lot would not hold all the people. But Jesus did not die for us to go back into a world. He died so that we can be forgiven and go to a place called heaven. But I'm not waiting on heaven. I'm living with Jesus now. We want to experience the joy in this teaching of drawing near to him and going to the next level. But it all starts with salvation. Now, I understand that we're in a Wednesday night service. And probably uh, you could safely say that most everybody in here is saved. That's very dangerous to assume. I said that's very dangerous to assume because we can have a head knowledge of God and not be born again. And so to go over salvation would be, would be doing the Word of God violence. We must start at salvation. And there's some things about salvation tonight that I want to bring out to you that I hope will reignite a fire within you and bring you to ready to go to the next level with God of passion. But it all starts at the level of salvation. Now, I want you to understand, no matter what level you're on, there's something that does, there's two things that do not change. It does not matter. Your status with God does not change. You are not more saved if you are on level four and somebody is on level one. Amen. There's no degrees of salvation. So I want to use that as a caveat. I don't want anybody to go out of here and say, well, Brother Bill taught there's degrees of salvation. No, he that the sun sets free is free indeed. And we are saved to the uttermost. That means if you're saved in one second, you're just as saved as somebody that's been saved a thousand years. Amen. Your status does not change with God. Two, God's love or, or approval of you does not change either. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk, watch this, not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So not only do we not have levels, we, we, we don't have levels of salvation. We are saved, born again. Amen? But then if we, if we are on this journey, God's approval, God's love for us, even if we're not on the journey, he still loves us to the uttermost. Now let's look at salvation level one a little bit deeper. As we look at the word surrender in the PowerPoint slide, we can communicate this word in terms such as, and we hear it in the evangelical world, going deeper with God or getting closer to God, or getting nearer to God, or pursuing after God, or chasing after God, or to hunger and to thirst after God, and, and to have a fire for God. All of us have probably heard that type of language and maybe heard messages that are preached on that, and all of those are good, but it all comes back to this one word, and that is surrender to the things of the Lord. Understand this now. Spiritual growth does not look the same for everyone either. It doesn't look the same. The principles are the same, but not everyone goes at the same pace 
Also understand, going to any level with God has nothing to do with our works. It has everything to do with the Holy Spirit drawing us to the next level. We can't work good enough to get to the next level. It is the Holy Spirit that draws us and says to Brother Bill, okay, Brother Bill, it's time to lay aside this weight now. You've been carrying that long enough. It's time for you to go. The Holy Spirit does that. And Bill, I want you to get rid of this attitude. I want you to get rid of this little sin that's besetting you from drawing closer to me. I want you to come closer, and the Holy Spirit helps me do that. The work of the Holy Spirit is the key. However, having said that, there is a responsibility on our part that is being obedient to the Holy Spirit's bidding. We must be obedient to the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit's call. Say, Bill, come closer. Bill, come closer. Bill, come closer. James chapter 4 verse 8 says this. Draw nigh to God and he will what? Draw nigh to you. That drawing is the work of the Holy Spirit. But as I mentioned, we cannot pursue or we cannot get closer to, we can't hunger after someone that we do not have a relationship with. And the only way to have a relationship with Jesus, the only way to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father and the power of the Holy Spirit is through and foremost salvation. That is the only way to get close to God is the first and foremost is you've got to come unto God and accept the free gift of salvation. There are metaphors that the Scripture gives to us to describe salvation. One, from death to life. John chapter 5 verse 24 says, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. When I was living in the world of sin, I was dead to the things of God. When I got born in April of 2003, I came from death to life. Somebody say amen. The second thing is from old to new, the Scripture teaches us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, the translation, the proper translation of that is all things become new then, and now all things are becoming new as the Holy Spirit works in our life. The third is from darkness to light. Acts chapter 26, verse 18, the Scripture says, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The fourth one is from slave to free. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 22 says, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, which means slave to sin, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, also he that is called, being free now, is Christ's servant. In other words, when we get saved, when we become born again, we are no longer a slave to sin, but we become a servant to Jesus Christ. Amen? The fifth one is this, from hopeless to being hopeful. Man, if that don't speak to anybody in this house, it ought to speak to some of you. Salvation takes us from being hopeless to having hope. Psalm 62 and verse 5 and 6 says, Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. I'm telling you, this born-again experience with God, friend, is a place that we can hide under the wings of the majesty of Almighty. We can come up under His covering. We can get under the rock of salvation, and we can make it to the end. Why? Because He puts us in a place that all those stuff comes against us. We will not be shaken. Hallelujah. On a Wednesday night, as I said, it'd be very easy for me to assume that everybody in here is saved. But yet, that's very dangerous for us to do. 
For those of us that are saved, that do have salvation, that are born again, that do have the gift of eternal life, it would do us all good to understand and to reflect and to remember and praise God that we do. Amen? That's something we never, ever, ever need to overlook. That is something we never need to stop giving God praise for. Those of us who understand that we've been brought out of darkness into light, those of us that understand we've been brought from hopeless to hopeful, from slave to free, from old to new, from death to life, you and I need to praise God for it and remember and reflect and thank Him for it. Amen? How many of you got in this thing by yourself? You need to be thankful. I said you need to be thankful. Every single day, I thank God for my salvation. Every single day, I said, Lord, I thank you for your mercy and your grace in my life and bringing me into a relationship with your son, Jesus. Every single day, I thank him for it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus... Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, when we are born again, we are no longer at enmity with God. We are no longer at enmity with God. That word enmity is a very strong word. It means that we are an enemy of God. It means we are against the things of God. In fact, the scripture teaches us that a carnal-minded person is at enmity with God. That's why it breaks God's heart when his children act carnal. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I knew he was going to get to you before the night was over. <laughs> when you and I that have the Spirit of God living within us, we have salvation. We have been born again. When we operate in carnality and flesh, it begins to lower us down, if you will, if you will, on a level to where we're not as close as maybe we once were. And if we're not careful, listen to me, because every single person in this building has a flesh nature. All of us. We have a flesh nature, and if we are not careful, if we do not put that under subjection, the carnality and the flesh, if we don't put that under subjection by the Holy Spirit, we will find ourselves entertaining things in the world, and then after a while, we'll find ourselves separated. It's called backslidden. Amen? Now, I didn't come to put you down. I came to lift you up. <laughs> That's what salvation will do. We must understand. We must remember. We must never get away from. And we must fully surrender to the fact of the matter that according to Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ, he died for us. Hallelujah. That word commendeth in Romans 5, 8 literally means that God made an unconditional commitment. Unconditional commitment. An unconditional commitment to you and I in the fact that he sent forth his son Jesus to be to die for us and to be the propitiation for our sins. He did that unconditionally. It was not based on our faithfulness to him, nor our ability to get to him on our own, but it was based solely on this fact, on one thing and one thing only, and that is this, God loves us. Amen? Unconditionally, he loves us. John three sixteen. you've heard it all your life, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, a lot of people, now stay with me right here for just a moment. A lot of people, they focus on the everlasting life part. Praise God for everlasting life. Thank God. And they never fully understand that everlasting life does not start when we leave this world. It starts at the moment of salvation. 
It's a life that we can live here with God. A life of joy, a life of peace, a life of no matter what comes down the way, I know that I've got peace with my God and there is no more enmity between me and him and he and I can walk hand in hand. He can walk beside me. He can lead me. He can guide me. Why? Because I am born again of the Spirit of God and my heavenly Father is my Father and I now walk with him hallelujah to God thank God for salvation church see a lot of people want to go to heaven salvation but not everybody wants to take up your cross daily and follow Jesus salvation man I'm telling you the Holy Spirit knocked me down with that when he spoke that into my spirit the other morning praying and seeking the Lord A lot of people want to go to heaven salvation. Just let me get to heaven. But not everybody wants to take up your cross daily and follow Jesus' salvation. And that's what Jesus requires. That's what he requires. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man's going to come after me, If any man's going to draw near to me, if any man's going to come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Mark's account of the gospel says we are to take up our cross daily. Luke's account in Luke chapter 9 verse 23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The way you get to the next level or to a drawing closer to God is you follow Jesus. Amen? But it all starts at salvation. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Is this tying together good for anybody here tonight? What was Jesus saying to his disciples? What was he saying? He was saying, you will live a life of surrender. At the moment of salvation, you will surrender. But then you will live a continuous life of surrendering. Every single day. I surrender my will to his will. I don't do that on my own. I do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I look unto Jesus and Jesus says, walk here. I'm going to walk here. If he says, stop here, I'm stopping here. If he says, sit down, let's eat. I'm sitting down and we're going to grub. Somebody say amen. 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 I follow Jesus, Brother Johnson. I look unto him. Why? Because I'm saved and I'm his. I'm his heir and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What he was saying was, is that at the moment of salvation, there is a surrender of one's life to Jesus, but then there is a continual surrendering if you're going to be my disciples. A lot of people want to be saved, and not everybody wants to be a disciple of Christ. It's just the truth. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 says, And we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid the iniquity us upon all, uh, all of us upon him. Every sin that's ever been committed in this entire world, Jesus took it to the cross. God laid the iniquity of us all, every one of us, upon his own son. And his own son willfully made the decision, I'm going to be in the will of God, the will of my Father, and I'm going to climb the hill of Golgotha. I'm going to suspend between heaven and earth, and I'm going to die for you so that you can have eternal life. Salvation is powerful. Amen? We must keep our love for level one. In fact, Jesus, you go to the book of Revelation, Jesus speaks to a church and he says, I have this against you because you have left your first. Anybody remember how in love with God you were when you first got saved? Amen? The commandment of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, watch this, in verse 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Go make disciples. The King James uh, reads this way, teach. It it means the same. Go and make disciples. Go and teach, which is uh, properly translated, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
our responsibility is to walk with people from their surrender of salvation and walk with them as they are surrendering unto the things of God. To a maturation level, to a place where we begin to mature, a level of being a disciple of Christ themselves. Listen, I'm not at the same place that I was 20 years ago when I got saved. I had some things in my life when I got saved that I had to deal with. I had to allow the Holy Spirit. Used to, there were things that I dealt with things a a certain way. I don't deal with that anymore. I, I just don't even, it just doesn't even bother me anymore because I see it for what it is. It's something that's trying to take me off the track and I just say, Holy Spirit, help me. And now I'm at a level that that little thing doesn't bother me. But now there are things that come against me that still try to beset me, but I depend on the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I am saved. Our responsibility is to walk with people from their surrender of salvation to a maturation level of being a disciple of Christ themselves. Converts are a beautiful thing to watch. Oh, it's a beautiful thing when somebody surrenders their life to God and they they lay themselves out before the Lord and say, God, here I am. I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. You took my sin. I believe in what you've done. It's a beautiful thing. It's even more beautiful as that life begins to walk with God. As they begin to walk with God and you watch them begin to blossom in the things of God. And now they no longer go to the places they used to go. They no longer do the things they used to do. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is doing a work in them so real and so strong. They're drawing nigh to God. They're climbing the level. They're getting closer to God. Come on, somebody. That's what we need uh, is people that are drawing nigh to God and getting away from the things of the world. Man, our witness depends on our drawing nigh to God. It does. It really does. Our character speaks more than what we say here. Amen? However, it is an individual's choice, as I said to you, and I'm, I'm almost closing. It is an individual's choice of whether they will surrender themselves to the next level in Christ or not. How do we get to the level of salvation? How do we get there? How do we come out of the world where we can't get ourselves out and onto the first level of salvation with God? Very easily. First, It's called conviction. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 8 says, Jesus is talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He says this, And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That is called conviction. The Holy Spirit tells me, Bill, 20 years ago, you are an enemy with God. You need to call on God. You are lost and undone without Jesus. You need to call on God. And the Holy Spirit came so strong, convicted me of my sins, and I said, yes, that's me. I am lost. The second way is faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For it is by grace through faith that you are saved, that not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. You can be in church all your life and not be born again. You can do all the works in the church that you can do. You can feed. You can go. You can give. You can do all of that. You can give a million dollars into the offering. By the way, we'll take that. It ain't no problem. We, we can get it somewhere. It won't be no problem. We'll get it to some missionaries. You can do all of that. But if you're not convicted of your sins and you don't come to Jesus by faith, you are not born again. (laughs) Whoo, glory. Third is confession. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I believe in what Jesus did on the cross by faith. I'm convicted of my sins, and now I'm confessing that Jesus is the one that did it. I believe it in my heart. Why? Because the Holy Spirit put it in there. I didn't do it here. The Holy Spirit put it in here, right? Not here, but in here. 
And when it gets here, now I can believe that he is the one that died on the cross and shed his blood so that I can be saved. And now I confess Jesus for John 14 and 6. You are the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Hallelujah. You're the only way. And the last is repentance. Luke chapter 5, verse 32. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know what repentance means? It simply means to change directions, to change your mind. What I used to not think was bad at all, now the Holy Spirit is drawn to my attention. Bill, that's against God's Word. At the moment of salvation, God does that. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. Conviction, faith, confession, repentance. Tonight, the first level is a reminder to some of you. I realize that. It's a reminder to some, those in this building who are saved but facing difficulties. What do you do when you face difficulties? What do you do when you're coming against things that are just surmountable, too big for you to handle? This is what you do. You reflect on the goodness of God that you are saved. And no matter what we go through here, now listen, some of you have gone through some stuff in this building that is horrendous. You've gone through some things in this life that because in this life there are things that are terrible. Even the child of God, it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. It's because we live in a fallen world. But the difference between the church and the world is we gather in and we thank God that all of this is coming against us. I'm still a child of the King. I'm still born again. And if God takes me out, I'm still going to heaven. Hallelujah. And I'm not going to allow the things of this world to rob me of the joy of my salvation where he took me out of the world and put me on the first step. Not doing it. Tonight, the first level is a reminder to some, those in this building, you need to reflect on the goodness of God. Hey, man, I'm, I'm born again. God, thank you. I'm born again. I'm saved. To others in this house or maybe listening by live stream, It's an opportunity for Jesus to be Lord of your life, forgive you of your sins, and give you eternal life tonight in that quick of a in time. How do we get to the next level? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and 3. Honey, come if you will. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Watch this. He says, since then you've been born again. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Since then you are now alive and not dead. You now see you're not blind. You're not walking in darkness. You're walking in the light. You're not hopeless. You now have hope. Watch this. Set your heart, set your affections on things that are above. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He said not only set your affections, set your heart, but you got to set your mind. Sometimes you got to have a mind reset. You do, you got to have a mind reset. You got to set your minds. You got to quit stinking thinking. <laughs> Amen. You got you got to say when that comes, you got to say no, 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 no. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about Jesus who's sitting on the right hand of God who came and saved me and set me free. I'm thinking on Jesus. I'm looking to him, the author and the finisher of my faith. I'm going to look to him. I'm going to set my heart on them, on him. I'm going to set my mind on Him, not on earthly things, because I'm dead to sin now and I'm alive to Christ. Tonight, the first step, seven levels of surrender, it's salvation. My prayer has been all day long and in these few, actually weeks that I've been putting this together and studying this out, asking God to help us. God, don't let me take it for granted that there's somebody under the sound of my voice that is not saved. We are commanded, Brother Mickey, to preach the gospel.
demand it. And if we try to take somebody to another level that they've never been on the first level of salvation, we do them an injustice. So I ask you tonight, are you born again? If breath leaves your body tonight, are you going to heaven? Are you saved? Are you living a life of joy and freedom? Or maybe you've been saved. You know you have. But your mind, your eyes got back on things of... You know, you know what the hardest thing for, for me? <laughs> I'm going to just be as transparent as I know how to be right here. The hardest thing for me is not what God delivered me out of. The alcohol and the drugs and all of that stuff. That's not. That's gone. That's done. I don't, I don't, I don't even have a craving for that junk anymore. You know what? You know what is mine? The enemy says, well, look at them. Well, look, look at them. Well, they're, they're not living at a level they should be. I didn't save them. I didn't set them free. I'm not dealing with the same thing they're dealing with. They may be on chapter 1 and I may be on chapter 25, but we're in the same book. Somebody say amen. I get my eyes off of people and I look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And if people want to add carnal and fleshly, that's on them. I can't go there with them because it besets me. It draws me back. It brings me back. I have to make my mind up and set my heart there and my mind there on Jesus. This is the altar service for tonight and then we're going to let you go. If you don't mind standing across the house of God tonight. On every person that's born again in this building. On every person in this building. 100% participation if we could. I want you to just come spend a few moments with God. And if you're born again, you need to remember and you need to remind yourself you're a child of God and you need to thank God for salvation. Because there's some things some of you are facing in this building you cannot do. You can't do it. But with God, all things are possible. And the reason you're with God is because Jesus came to an old rugged cross and laid his life down for you and I. I'm going to ask every person in this building to come to this altar and just begin to thank God for salvation tonight. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you. Come on, spend some time. Now, some of you, you're going to...